ロペス博士に譲りたいと思います。So, Tiago, could you start your,、uh, could you please share the talk, please?、Uh, yes, okay. Thank you very much, Sensei, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a great, great pleasure to be here today. And it's great to invite a longtime collaborator, Dr. Tatiani. So, we have been working remotely since more than two and a half years. And it's interesting that we haven't met in person, but now she's in Tokyo. So, I thought it would be a great opportunity to have her sharing her knowledge. And we talked a lot about the depth of this presentation, you know, how deep should you know, she go? And I kind of asked her to show an overview of reinforcement learning and not so many equations and the details of the algorithms. But if you are interested in that, you can ask as many questions as you want. And if you want to talk later, you know, exchange some emails or so. I think she mentioned she is also open you know, to answer some more specific questions. So, with that in mind, I think it's time. I don't want to take too much longer. And I'll transfer here to Dr. Tatiani. And I think it's all yours. Okay.、Um, thank you very much, Thiago, for this, this presentation. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Tatiana Nogueira Rios from Federal University of Bahia, Brazil. And it's a pleasure to stay here to share my computer science knowledge. I'm very happy with your attention and the special invitation of Tiago for our collaboration work.、Um, at this talk, I will present some news and important highlights concerning to how enforcement learning in healthcare. Um, during my talk, I will follow this outline. First, I will introduce the theme, showing some motivation and contextualization of the research in reinforcement learning in healthcare. Secondly, I will present essential theory foundations to understand how the reinforcement learning methods work without formulas and equations. Don't be worried. Next, I will show you some methods usually used to solve health healthcare problems, followed by general approaches already done. And in the five point of my presentation, I will discuss some challenges refreshment learning faces in healthcare, followed by new insights for intelligent healthcare systems. And finally, I will point out some highlights of the talk. Um, well, we have notes that big companies like、uh, Amazon, Google, Google, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, and others are significantly investing in the research and development of artificial intelligence.、Um, and this continuous research and innovation are driving the adoption of advanced technologies in the industry. And in the retail, financing, manufacturing, and as expected, healthcare. As we can see in this picture, AI is a significant revolutionary element of the upcoming digital area. As we can see, new technologies also present in our reality. So many companies are working to make AI more accessible for everyone. And for example, we can see that high expensive surgeries can be replaced by robots that can be cost effective and beneficial to patient treatment. We also can see that AI can help in the management of hospital records. AI can reduce the time needed for diagnosis and treatment. AI can easily track specific patient data with. Which can help in individual treatment. And very near o f our real life, AI used in wearable healthcare devices provides faster detection of problems 
that some conventional problems process. For example, we can use our smartwatch or smartphone to, to help us with our healthcare. Besides, in a significant direction, the use of AI for drug discovery was recently evidenced by the coronavirus pandemic. AI can predict how a drug might interact with the animal model more quickly and successfully. For example, we can see that recently, the DeepMind has developed the alpha fold to protein fold. Here in this picture, we can see that the experimental result is very similar, very near to computational predictions. And here in this paper, Tiago, Ricardo, and I have revealed fundamental properties of the human coagulation factor eight by AI. So we, we can see that AI can also be used for drug discovery in a faster and safer way. However, without careful implementation, artificial intelligence could widen healthcare inequality. Here in this, this paper, recently published at Nature, we need to mind the gap. The problem is that the use of AI depends on the data availability. And usually, this data mirror the unequal health system we see today. So it's necessary to promote fairness through AI by investing in decision-making systems that use interactions, experience with the world and evaluative feedback. That's the case of reinforcement learning that is the focus of this presentation today. So reinforcement learning is a subfield in machine learning, which is a subfield in artificial intelligence. While artificial intelligence refers to the general ability of computers to emulate human reasoning, machine learning refers to the technologies and algorithms that enable systems to identify patterns, make decisions, and improve the systems by experience, for example. Machine learning can be divided in three paradigms. Here we see supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. By supervised learning, we have labeled data. In this case, uh, a system learns something from this kind of data. And for example, an expert needs to inform when a tumor is malignant or not. Then the system learns the main characteristics of each tumor. And then as soon as a new tumor is detected by the system, the system can predict if the new one is malignant or not. So we need a supervision obtained from an expert. On the other side, we have unsupervised learning, which means that a system learns something from unlabeled data. For example, by unsupervised learning, it's possible to organize data without the help of a specialist. So in this example, we can see that we can put together two more that have similar characteristics. We can organize the data without the ex specialist. And finally, a reinforcement learning means that a system choose an action at each time step based on its current state and receives evaluative feedback in the new state from the environment. Here in the picture, we can see that, that the information that a sample responds well if it's treated with this dose. So we have specific conclusion from the data that's made of state action pairs. So an intelligent agent learns by reinforcement when it choose which actions are the best through trial and neural interactions with the environment. The agent's goal is to learn an optimal policy, which means the mapping from the states to the actions. 
that maximizes the accumulated reward it receives over time. So let's see a video to understand the reinforcement learning process. Here, we can see a chicken learning by reinforcement. In this case, the reinforcement is the food. Uh, always that the chicken select the correct cycle, they can get food. The, the goal is to collect more food, so maximize the reward, that in this case is the food. As you can see, uh, step by step, as soon as the time pass, the chicken become more, um, learns more about the characteristics of the cycle as soon as uh, it collects the reward, the food. Well, in this case, uh, the reinforcement learning has the basic idea the agent needs to receive feedback in the form of rewards, must learn to act, maximizing expected reward. reward. So the agent is the, chi the chicken, and the environment is composed by the chicken and the reward collector and actions. And then all learning is based on observed samples of outcomes. The trial in narrow interactions of the environment in a regular reinforcement learning process is named exploration. During the exploration, the agent has to try unknown actions to get information. That's the, it's a phase very important in the reinforcement learning process. Then, the agent is capable to choose which actions are the best. That is the exploitation phase of the reinforcement learning. Eventually, the agent has to use what to know after the exploration process. Let's see another video. In this video, we have a robot arm. Let's see. And the robot learns via, via trial, trial and error how to put the cube in the correct place. In this phase, we have the exploration. The robot is exploring the environment. After 30 trials, then the robot already know how to put the cube in the correct place. This is the exploitation. So, we can do this process, exploration and exploration, by using some methods of reinforcement learning. We have two kinds of reinforcement learning. Uh, the first is, is named model-based methods and is also referred to as planning methods. They require a complete description of the model and this description of the models contains a transition function and a reward function. So here we have a completely a model. The model is, com is composed by states. States is the phase from a, a problem a transit. And we have states and actions from these states and reward here in green collected from this action. So a model is a representation that explicitly encodes knowledge about the structure of the environment. Um, I highlight here those poss two possibilities to use model-based methods. Consider we have a model of the world we can use the model in a lot of different ways. These two ways that I highlight is exploration and hierarchical reasoning. By exploration used using a model-based method for reinforcement learning, it's possible to uh, 
uh, reset the final state and explore backward from there rather than starting from the initial state. For example, the Hubic cube. In this game, there is only one goal, but maybe several possible starting states. Another possibility is using a low level algorithm to generate the solution, the plan for of high level action. So considering an higher hierarchical reasoning, also in the Ubix cube solver, we can have a low level algorithm that generates the controls to choose which Ubix cube face should rotate. So we have the problems of the mechanical hand, the mechanical fingers, and also how to choose the best face to rotate uh, to solve the problem. But we do not have access to the model in all cases, so we need to learn the model. When we need to learn the model, we, we say that we have model-free methods of reinforcement learning. And these method, methods also refer to as learning methods. They learn an optimal policy based on received observations and rewards. So here we have the environment and the agent is composed by a learning algorithm and the policy that they choose after the process of exploration. And we can use a model, not in the whole process of learning, but, but you can use the model in some parts of the learning process. First, it's possible to replace the environment with a model for generating data and updating the policy. For example, here we can see the model, uh, how we can model the human uh, simulation. Let's see the video. Once you can model the environment, we can put this model as the environment for the harm robot. Secondly, we also can modify the learning algorithm to use the model to interpret new data. So we can, we can put interventions in the system to improve the learning algorithm, as you can see in the next video. So, so here uh, we can see that it's possible to uh, assist the learning algorithm use a model. And, there, and then in a third direction, it's possible to allow the agent at this time to use the model to try out different actions before it commits to one of them. So we also can use the model in the policy uh, choose. Like here in this video, we can see examples of straightening the policy. So we can uh, simulate uh, mechanically some improvements in the problem. Finally, we can obtain from, from reinforcement learning systems closer to human reasoning and decision making. The goal is to obtain this human reason. And this robotic arm, for example, it's a big challenge that was um, developed by OpenAI. And we can see this process here in the whole video. We're trying to build robots that learn a little bit like humans do by trial and error. What we've done is train an algorithm to solve the Rubik's Cube one-handed with a robotic hand, which is actually pretty hard even for a human to do. We don't tell it how the hand needs to move the, the cube in order to get there the particular friction that's on the fingers, how easy it is to turn the faces on the cube, what the gravity, what the weight of the cube is, all of these things, it needs to learn by itself. The interesting thing is that 
kind of standard techniques in robotics haven't been able to scale to that complexity that we see in a robotic hand. Humans have evolved to be able to manipulate and operate our hands. So there's a huge amount of learning that's happened through evolution to get us to this point as a, as a species. And the robot has to learn all of this from scratch. Instead of trying to write very dedicated algorithms to operate such a hand, we took a different approach where we create thousands of different simulated environments and learn to do the task in all of those. And hopefully a robotic hand will be able to do it in the real world as well. This means like thousands of years of experience that this neural network has had in simulation. Every time the algorithm has gotten good at the task, we make the task harder. That's really crucial because it needs exposure to really complicated environments in order to eventually be robust to the real world. You put a rubber glove on the hand and can still carry out the task. This ability to generalize to new environments feels like a very core piece of intelligence. It really changes the way we think about training general purpose robots. Moving from thinking too much about the actual algorithms and start thinking about how do we create complex enough worlds where they can learn. At some point, then it would be more down to the imagination what robots could actually accomplish. The hope is to build robots that can do many different tasks to increase the standard of living and give everybody a better life. So great. Here in the video, we can hear some keywords, uh, piece of intelligence. Uh, and this piece of intelligence were obtained by this system, but it's also, but it's a single agent system. Uh, and we can do reinforcement learning also in multi-agent system. Uh, we have observed in the previous uh, example, the use of in a single A system, but reinforcement learning can be also used in a more complex multi-agent environment. In this case, we have several agents learning from each other while cooperating or competing. So uh, to get advancement in this type of environment, a group of Japanese researchers organized a workshop in October 1992 here in Tokyo when they discussed possible grand challenge problems. And then they created the Hub Cup, a robot World Cup soccer game, and this, this RoboCup soccer game is used to promote the improvement of science and technology through robotics and AI research, offering not only a, a public appealing like the robot har harm of AI, but a formidable challenge because of the complexity of the environment. Let's see another video now about multi-agent system. RoboCup started with a very crazy idea, basically, to build a team of humanoid robots that can win against the FIFA World Champion. But I think the idea is really great because it instills a lot of long-term interesting development in robotics and AI. So over the years, RoboCup gained more and more interest. We added leaks. Initially, we had only robots moving around on wheels and simulated soccer. Now we have humanoids in different leagues. We have application-oriented leagues with rescue, with at home and at work. And we added junior for interesting young people in STEM subjects. So I think it's a really great movement. So RoboCup started in 1997. Uh, we have the first competition in Nagoya. 
And after then, so we had annual event each year around the world. And we started the competition of football using the robot. Uh, but uh, after then, we increase the domain. In RoboCup 2016, we have close to 3,000 participants and altogether 1,200 robots. It's exciting because uh, we have robots playing soccer and that in itself is exciting. And then when it happens out on the field, you get to see your research actually manifest itself in something fun. So, in that sense, I have a PhD student conducting his studies to improve human-ed soccer game. Since 2017, we have won several competitions, and I want to highlight the last one when we obtained third place in RoboCup's human-ed 3D simulation competition. In that competition, we have proposed using reinforcement learning to choose a set of set plays during the game. So we can see how the reinforcement learning really can be applied in a multi-agent system. And our proposal can be checked in our papers produced from then. And now I'll show you uh, one sample of our competition. This is our team. So it's a hard problem because we learn by reinforcement in this case by each order. We learn an agent learns with other agents. They competing, they cooperating, and they collect the reward. In this case, the reward is the goal, but can be other, other, other things. So such distinct Features make a reinforcement learning technique a suitable candidate for developing robot solutions also in a variety of healthcare domain. Because one goal of healthcare decision making is to develop effective treatment regimes that can dynamically adapt to the varying clinical states and improve the long term benefits of patients. So we have individual solutions in healthcare. Uh, also in healthcare, we have what we name as dynamic treatment regimes. These DTRs are a sequence of decision rules to determine the course of actions at a time point according to the current health status and prior treatment history of an individual patient. For example, a treatment type, drug dosage, or re-examination time. So, we can transform a DTR in a reinforcement learning process. So we can see, for example, decision rules can be seen as policy in reinforcement learning. Treatment outcomes can be seen as reward functions. And a set of clinical observations and assessment of patients can be seen at the states in reinforcement learning. And treatment options at each stage can be seen at action, as actions in reinforcement learning. So, by careful engineering the reward function using expert, the doctors, for example, or domain knowledge, reinforcement learning provides an elegant way for multi-objective optimization of a treatment, for example. Um, reinforcement learning considering as, considering as a DTRs can be applied to two main healthcare conditions, chronic diseases and critical care. 
Uh, chronic disease normally feature a long period lasting uh, three months or more expected to require continuous clinical observation and medical care. And this long-term treatment or this illness is often made up of a sequence of medical interventions that must take into account the changing healthy status of a patient and adverse effects occurring from previous treatment. So the relationship of treatment duration, dosage, and type against the patient's response is too complex to be explicitly specified. In this case, the reinforcement learning fits well. Some protocols are derived from average response to treatment in populations of patients. But selecting the best sequence of treatments for an individual patient poses significant challenges due to the diversity across um, or within the population. Reinforcement learning has been utilized to automate the discovery and generation of optimal DTRs, and reinforcement learning can achieve precise results for individuals who may possess uh, high heterogeneity in response to some treatment. So the challenge is, is continue to be the individuality in the treatment of chronic disease. And the reinforcement learning have been extensively studied in deriving efficient treatment strategies for endocrine disease, cardiovascular disease, various mental illness, cancer, uh, HIV infection, obesity, and others. And we can see this in this last uh, published papers in Nature and um, important journals uh, of research. Uh, but unlike the treatment of chronic disease, which usually requires a long period of constant monitoring and medication, critical care is dedicated to more serious ill or injured patients that are in need of special medical treatments and nursing care. So critical care is dedicated to more serious ill in need of special medical treatment and nursing care. Usually, such patients are provided with an intensive care unit, ICU, for intensive monitoring and close attention. In this case, the challenge is the inherent three Cs, compartmentalization, corruption, and complexity. These features indicate that critical care data are usually noisy, biased, and incomplete, what becomes the machine learning process very hard to do. Uh, reinforcement learning has been also widely applied in, treat in treatment of sepsis, regulation of sedation, and some other decision-making problems in ICU, such as mechanical ventilation and heparin dosing. And we can see this in papers published in the last year and this year also. True. Well, we could note some challenges the development of reinforcement learning in healthcare. But there are some points that need to be highlighted. First of all, researchers are not able to observe everything that happens in the body. So the environment of this kind of problem is very complex because we, can, we cannot explore all of the environment as we can do in some games, for example. And the health data are non-stationary, what means that patient symptoms are often recorded at irregular intervals, and uh, some patients' vital signs are recorded more often than others. So the conditions are different from a patient for, to another. Moreover, Periodic improvements in blood pressure may not impact the final patient's condition in the case of sepsis, for example. And it's necessary to consider causality in interpreting the effects of a treatment. So the reward function is difficult to determine in this case. That's the, the challenge, the biggest challenge of reinforcement learning in healthcare. Uh, 
but the computer science in the healthcare community are engaged in providing interpretable reinforcement learning solutions. These interpretable solutions uh, can increase the robustness, safety, and correctness of learning strategies in healthcare domains. From such engagement, I can point out some new insights for the development of, health, of reinforcement learning in healthcare. Some intelligent healthcare systems can combine the integration of prior knowledge with the treatment process uh, and the interaction of an expert knowledge with the automatic learning data would significantly enhance the knowledge discovery process. Learning from user interaction, reasoning about users' goals and intentions, and planning activities and future interactions could improve this learning process. Another important point in the new insight for intelligent healthcare systems is that in silico study is essential as a tool for early stage exploration or direct, direct derivation of adaptive treatment strategy by providing approximate or highly simplified model. But in vivo study is urgently required to really be assess the performance and personalization of the proposed reinforcement learning approaches in real life implementations. Because safety is of paramount importance in medical settings. It's imperative to ensure that the actions during learning be safe enough when dealing with in vivo subjects. So in healthcare domains, the consequences of wrong actions are not merely limited to bad performance. So this is, ob is it, it's obviously true when dealing with a real patient who would possibly not survive the long-term repeated treatment Trail, a trial and error of reinforcement learning. So as a solution, we propose the sample level batch learning methods that can be applied for more efficient use of batch sample. Model-based methods enable also better use of samples by building the model of the environment. So um, to finish my talk, I want to emphasize that most current studies are built upon predefined functions to map state and actions into some integer numbers. However, it's unclear how changing these numbers would affect the resulting optimal solutions. So understand the robustness of reinforcement learning methods in uncertain healthcare settings is the subject of ongoing critical investigations by statistics, computer science, and healthcare communities that to what we are doing today, for example. Uh, Tiago, Ricardo, and I are working a lot to, to obtain solutions for individual treatments in in any in of disease. So I'm finishing. And I want to thank you, some, some people important to me. Uh, I'd like to, to thank, I'm very grateful to the Institute of Computing at Federal University of Bahia, where I have the position of assistant profession. I want to give a special thing, thanks to my research lab, Computational Intelligence and Optimization Research Lab, where I can develop the high quality research in artificial intelligence by supervised bachelor, master, and PhD students. And I'm pleased to stay here at National Center of Child Health and Development, developing a collaborative work with Tiago, helping to improve the health of future generations. And I'm also here with the support of Terum Life Science Foundation which invigorates science and technology in Japan by promoting the international exchange in life science and technology.
field. We know that Japanese medical technology makes its contribution to the front lines of healthcare throughout the world. And I'm very happy to be part of this. Thank you very much. All right. So I think we are, thank you very much for sharing all this knowledge. So I think we are open to questions, right? So if someone has some questions, they can just ask or they can send in the chat box. I think it's all good. So while people think about the questions, may I ask something? So I wanted to ask something about this, this you know, the reinforcement learning story. So I was wondering, with reinforcement learning, which kind of problems can we model? So how the problems look like, the kind of things that we can model with reinforcement learning? Well, it's a, a very good question. Well, it's possible to use reinforcement learning in problems where you have state and actions and the primary data. So considering, for example, the hemophilia treatment, you can view each phase of this treatment as a state, whereas the actual is what's obtained from one phase to another. Another essential character is to be modeled uh, in this case is the reward function. And in this example, the treatment time can be a good reward in the learning process. I see. Okay, so then it's a kind of problem that we have states and transitions and then rewards between these states. Is that correct? Yes, you collect oh. a reward when oh. you pass from in state to another. I see, I see. Okay. And, and how much data do we need to model this kind of problem? This is always a good question and uh, a gold question. Uh, there is not a rule concerning the amount of data enough to train a reinforcement learning model. However, when we have more data, more generalization is possible to obtain from the learning process. Let's remember the chicken. If you have more cycle, more time, more uh, uh, in the best way uh, it could learn the, the cycle, the color, how to get more reward. So more data, more learning. Exactly, exactly. I, I heard this, that there is no better data than more data. <laughs> yes. I see. So one, one, le one last question for me, I promise, and then I'll let other people ask is, what about the hardware? So which kind of computers do we need so can I run this kind of thing on my laptop or do we need something else? Yes, you can if the problem is, is easy. <laughs> uh, the reinforcement learning process is very hard because we obtain useful exploitation when we, when we perform deep exploration. In that sense, reinforcement learning depends on huge computational source. Uh, so that depends on the volume of data. If we have more data, more res computational resource you need. Okay, so it's like a GPUs and everything like this? Yes, yes, that's the point. Right, right. Okay, oh, I, I think from my part, that's all. So do other people have some questions? It's a great chance to ask Dr. Tatiani. You know, she's here, so. All right, so I think our yeah, folks Diego, are a little. Yep. Diego, mm -hmm. Diego, could I ask you a question? Yes, of course. Okay, great. Uh, actually, uh, I mean, this could be a naive question because I'm not uh, expert as in the AI. But the point is that uh, we are actually the children's hospital and the mother's hospital. Uh, we by using reinform reinforcement technology, 
uh, you mentioned something like uh, you, you, we can use it, uh, you can use it uh, intensive care unit story or other healthcare story. Uh, what can we do by using the reinforcement technology in the field of pediatrics or the obstetrics, OBGY field? Uh, first of all, we need to model a process. So we, we need to check what, what do we need to observe in the treatment, in the pediatrics, for example, uh, the age of the, the patient, the process of the treatment, so the rules of the treatment, the time of the treatment. So let's suppose we need to choose one problem, uh, a disease, for example. For each disease, we have a plan. This plan is our model. From this model, we can pass from the state to another state, and then the algorithm could can learn how to recommend the best treatment for a, an individual patient. So we needed to put in the model also the characteristics of the treatment phase. For example, uh, if a person, if a child is too small, we have con we need to conduct a treatment in another way, for example. So we need to put these characteristics in the model. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Rios. Actually, I'm very much impressed uh, uh, the answer, and I'm, I'm 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 really happy that if that kind of uh, re AI research can be accomplished. And uh, the second question is uh, this is the, the other last question, but uh, uh, speaking of the. Uh, you, I'm very much impressed with the AI Sakagi by using your AI model or engine or the classifier. And uh, what did you take a role in the Sakage? You analyze what you generated, or establish a robot, or what did you do in the soccer game? In the soccer game, we need to observe the position of the players. Okay. So the position it's very is very important. So uh, once an agent needs to choose for who they need to kick the ball, we we need to observe the distance from an agent and another. But in the humanoid um, category, we have more complexity. Not the distance is enough, but the controls of the legs, the arm, the head, they need to stay up. For example, as you can see in the video, sometimes the robot fell. <laughs> right, right. I, they, I, they I, know to, I noticed. They don't know how to control her uh, its body. So okay. uh, in the process, we need to put as characteristics of the model, the control of the agent, the distance from the agent to another, and the goal. For example, sometimes I play uh, an agent needs to kick the, 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 the ball to do the goal, mm -hmm. or sometimes they, sometimes they just need to defend from another player. So it's a very complex uh, problem, but we needed to model each agent individually and all the process in the environment, that is the soccer. Okay, thank you so much, and obrigado. You're welcome. Yeah, I was impressed, you know, that the team from the from your university got the third place in this thing. Yes. So, and the person is the PhD student, right? Sorry? The, the person who came to Japan to compete is PhD student? Yes, it's my PhD student. Uh, in fact, we have a team, but the, we have a head of the team that is the PhD student. And they needed to program the team during all of the year. And once a year, they come to the competition. And this competition, we, the challenge is not only to win the game, but to propose a new, a new approach to improve the team. And because of that, that after the competition, we can publish the papers with our approach. 
I see. I see. That's that's interesting. It's a very good contribution. I mean, they use the competition as a kind of a, a very nice stage for a scientific contribution. That's a good idea. Yes, we we use the data of the competition to validate our approach that can be used in another situation. For example, we can use this approach that he proposed uh, last year uh, for drones, for example, because we okay. have multi-agent systems and then we can uh, scale this, <laughs> this approach. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, how Robocup can improve the research in this area. Okay, okay. Very good, very good. Well, I think we are approaching the closing time for this session. And I want to thank once more, Dr. Tatiani, Dr. Omezal, uh, for Diego, Hi, excuse me Diego, this. Diego, actually, yep. the coach has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. I think Dr. Okamura, please, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I cannot use my camera. Don't worry. Uh, basically, I am a molecular geneticist, and I have some experience building AI models using uh, su supervised machine learning, using supervised machine learning, such as linear classification and deep learning. So before listening to this, your presentation, I have never recognized whether my data is stationary or dynamic. Because I am a geneticist, I use DNA sequences, epigenetic data. They are all non-stationary uh, data. They are not dynamic. And some doctors in this hospital asked me, uh, whether I can build an AI model using these photographs, photos, image photos. So they are all stationary. So in this presentation, uh, you explained uh, reinforcement learning. I am very impressed, but I have no idea how to use reinforcement learning using my data. So. Do you know some studies using reinforcement learning in genetics data or photo data? That yes. is my question. Uh, sometimes we can use reinforcement learning as an optimization uh, approach. So we can use the reinforcement learning to train supervised models. So we need to, to try the best hyperparameters of a supervised learning, for example. Uh, I already saw some uh, approaches that use reinforcement learning in that case, especially because uh, the data are non-stationary. So we, we can see that the, the result of the supervised learning change as soon as the data change. So we can use a reinforcement learning not to, to learn the, the labels of your data, but to learn the best way to learn your, uh, your uh, computer learning process. OK, thank you very much. I have to find the data that can be used for reinforcement learning. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, Dr. Okamura, for the question. Does anybody else would like to answer anything or, or I mean, to ask anything? Okay. So Dr. Tatiani will be in Tokyo for a few weeks. If you think about something later or something that you would like to talk, I think she might be happy to receive a contact from you. And with all that said, Dr. Umezawa, do we have anything else or is that all for today? That's all for today. So once more, Dr. Tatiani, thank you very much. I appreciate your talk. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, count on me. I, I, I'm really happy to stay here. Okay. So see you next week. So we have another talk next week. I'll send the announcement soon. Thank you.
See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Obrigado. Por nada. <laughs>